dear God, we thank you. Um, Lord, just for a reminder that uh, our faith is radical. And Lord, our comfort zone should be wherever you send us, no matter how radical it is. So Lord, help us to just bust out of the mold, and whether it be just to minister to a neighbor or be at a park and be willing to witness and to support or whether it be to go, God, that we are always just willing and ready and able, God. And even as we look at this passage today, which enables us, empowers us to do whatever you call us to do, may it be that we have open hearts to receive whatever you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Please turn there as we travel verse by verse through the book of Acts. So where are we? Well, Jesus had died on the cross for our sins. He'd risen on the third day, and then he spent many days ministering to his disciples in his new body and giving them some directive. And one of the things that he told them was, don't dare leave this place to do what I asked you to do unless you have the ability and the empowerment to do so, and that is by the giving of God's Holy Spirit into your life. And he ascended after that. He went back up to heaven, and now they're in the city of Jerusalem waiting for this promise, not really knowing the full impact of what this promise would bring. And so there's a few days between five and ten days that they're waiting for this promise promise. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So on the day of Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost was one of three feasts each year where all Jewish men were required to come to Jerusalem. And it wasn't a feast of of mourning. It it, it wasn't a, a, a time of of fasting. It wasn't a time of repentance. It was a time of celebration. And they would come and basically they would, they, they would celebrate what, what God had provided. It was the feast where they celebrated the, the early harvest, saying, God is plentiful, God is good. And so it was the kind of feast that everybody wanted to come to. I mean, hey, let's go on a retreat and we'll all fast. Or, hey, let's go on a retreat and we'll, we'll all eat. Which one are you more likely to go to, Right. And so it was quite the, quite the feast, and Jews were required to come from all over the world to, to come to this place. And, and so we know that this is 50 days after Passover. That's why Pentecost, 5, 5 oh, 50 days after this time, would be the early harvest, the feast of first fruits that it's also called in Exodus 34. Again, it was a celebration of, of new things, of new life, of, of new harvest. Now, I want you to note that back when the law was given, now the law wasn't meant to bring life necessarily. It created the ability for people to have fellowship with God through the law. But the law was not the end. They were always waiting for something else. And, and so the law actually showed them their need for an ultimate sacrifice. A savior because the law would have to be repeated year after year sacrifice 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 But when Jesus Christ came he didn't come as an animal He came as a human being to represent man before God And when he went to the cross he didn't represent his own sins He represented your sins and he was the sacrifice that could take away all sins Why because he died and he rose again and he forever lives to intercede for you He was the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and so when the law was given The law points out where we fail. How many of you fulfill the Ten Commandments? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I don't commit adultery. I don't murder. Have you ever disrespected your parents? Yeah? Have have you ever disrespected God and taken his name in vain and called yourself a Christian even though you weren't doing Christian things at the moment? You know, have you ever coveted? Have you ever lied? (laughs) You know, and then we, we get into those things. We're like, whoa. So even the Ten Commandments reveal the the holiness of God and his goodness and the failure of man. And so the law brings death. And the day that the law was given, when Moses was up on the mountaintop and he came down, what were the people doing? Sinning. 
doing? Worship being a, 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 an idol, reveling, possibly running around naked and dancing in front of this thing. When God's calling them to holiness, they're worshiping a false god. And so they're in sin. And on that day, 3,000 of the people died. When the Spirit's given, we're going to see next week that 3,000 people come to know eternal life when the Spirit is given. See the difference? You got the law, and then you got the Spirit of life. And so that's what we're looking at today with the Spirit being given on this very day, which brings life. And so, who are the people that are gathered? They are the followers of Christ who are waiting for the promise. They were in a meeting place on or near the Temple Mount. They were in one accord because they were praying, obedient, and fellowshipping together over the truth of God. How do churches get out of one accord? They get into all these other things. (laughs) They spend their time on the internet listening to other people attacking people and all this craziness instead of fellowshipping with one another loving one another serving god serving one another in prayer with one another bringing unity and truth where they can unite in one accord together under the truth of god and so here they were being obedient and waiting on the lord and in verse 2 it says and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting And so this is a new movement, a a new time. Whenever the Holy Spirit's present, you don't always hear wind. (laughs) In Corpus Christi, you can claim it because it's always windy here, but (laughs) it's not always done with wind. But whenever God starts a new thing, very often he does things a little bit differently, and this is the case. And so you hear this sound. It filled the house. It filled not necessarily the house, but the meeting place, because that word can be meant as a meeting place. Now, again, it's interesting that it comes like a wind. They, they reckon it to wind. But understand that the, the word we use, wind, is the same root behind the Hebrew and Greek words for spirit. In Greek, it's uh, a, a pneuma, like numeric tires full of air, okay? And, and so it means breath, wind, or spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, what is it? It is like a mighty rushing wind now in acts 2 it's like a mighty rushing wind obvious for elijah what was it it was a still small voice okay and and the reason i point this out is we need to be careful not to put the spirit in a box and think that he's always going to act in certain ways right because if the spirit's present it doesn't have to be in one way or another you know he he can come in many different forms and fashions to speak to us or to minister to us now also concerning the holy spirit and his coming jesus connected being born again with the work of the holy spirit and with the coming of the holy spirit becomes an incredible revival that spreads throughout the earth to us in corpus christi texas (laughs) after all these all these millennia and in john 3 8 it says the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it But you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And I love the idea of the Spirit being something that we don't control, right? Now, if you look out in Portland, you have these windmills. And these windmills are on a swivel. Why? Because the wind always doesn't come from the same place. It's something that's beyond our power. Now, we can control the air conditioning in a room, but we cannot control the wind on the earth, can we? And it's foolish to think that we can control the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so we do submit to the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about this a lot today. But the Holy Spirit is not controlled by you. Now, the Holy Spirit's always going to act within the character of God. You need to understand this. The Holy Spirit is loving, perfect in his decisions and his guidance. He never desires anything horrible for you. But you don't control the Holy Spirit. And so often people seek to do this but you don't you let him move where he would you know the andrus family didn't decide you know 10 years ago oh it sounds like a good place to move to Mombasa. that would be you know when i'm 47 48 years old i think I'll, I'll, i'll just move there it's a good place but what happened the holy spirit moved in a way very unexpected to them we've known them for 10 years they've been going through this for seven you know and we were like whoa 
what is God doing in you? What is the Holy Spirit? Where's the Holy Spirit blowing you? You know, but you can see it in their hearts. They want to be there. And, and it's a passion, but it's what the Holy Spirit is. I can't tell you, if you completely submit to God, your life is just going to be cool. Like, you can just be the same. Because he'll rock your world and turn you right side up is what he loves to do. And so we don't have control of the Spirit. And so it's related to the wind blowing where it desires. And listen, we need to learn to ride the wind. We don't control it. We go with it. You can only go where the wind blows if you're waiting upon the wind to get you there. You need to recognize it, and you don't fight it. We soar on wings as eagles, and we run and do not grow weary, and we walk and do not be faint. And so God calls us to listen and to be moved by his spirit. We don't, under, we don't understand it all the time, but we do know its character and the principles by which the Holy Spirit, he is going to guide us. Verse 3, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Now, so there's not just the sound, but there's something visual occurs, and it's not fire on their heads. <laughs> It's, it's something above their heads that they use the term fire. It's as fire. We don't, we don't know specifically what it looked like, but it was similar to fire. And again, if you relate the Holy Spirit to fire, what does fire do? It consumes, doesn't it? And it's powerful. Verse 4, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised and John had foretold. Acts 1, 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay? And so the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they speak in tongues. Different languages is what it means. D.L. Moody said this, If we are full of pride and conceit and ambition and self-seeking and pleasure and the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. And I believe many a man's praying to God to fill him when he is already filled with something else. You know, and so these people are sitting there, they're confused. They're in the perfect place to hear from God and submit to God, right? Because a, a few days earlier, Jesus told them, wait here. Don't, don't, don't go out. Just wait. And this promise of the Holy Spirit, he's going to come upon you with power, Acts 1.8. And that power means ability and the, the, the power to get something done. And it's going to be unusual. So they're sitting here, and they're just waiting. You know, they saw Jesus Christ crucified. They saw him raised again. And they took instruction from him for those 40 or so days and then, all of a sudden, they're just here, and the anticipation is great. And they are so willing to receive. Now, remember that word, willing. Remember the term submitted. Remember the term sacrificed and surrendered. This is the idea. This is where their mindset is. They are not full of themselves. They're waiting for the Lord to fill them. And they are being enabled at this moment by the Holy Spirit to speak in languages they have never learned before. They're speaking words that they themselves do not understand. Now, some churches teach that everyone who is even saved, or certainly everyone who is filled with the Spirit, must speak in tongues to prove it. Nowhere does the Bible tell us that you've got to speak in tongues to prove you're saved, right? But you have this, and then you can go to a seminar to learn how to speak in tongues, and it only costs you $250, which is ridiculous, right? But Paul asks the question, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 are all about the gifts. And in 12, 29 through 30, he says, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the implied answer for each question in the Greek grammar is no. It's a rhetorical question. You guys see that there? So not all speak with tongues. And so in the New Testament, there are multiple places where people are filled with the Spirit and do speak in tongues. And other places, there's, in the book of Acts, there's places where people are manifesting the Spirit of God, but tongues aren't mentioned. Okay? And, and here's the thing. Different people have different gifts. The Spirit gives the gifts 
to whom he will to work out within the body. And the thing is, you are part of the body of Christ. He is the head of the church, and you are a part of the body. And if the whole body were a foot, how would you eat? Right? You know, or, or if the whole body was a mouth, how would you get to go somewhere to speak? You know? And so we're all very different in the makeup of the body. But unless you are seeking to fulfill that which God called you to do, the body is incomplete. And so he gives different giftings to different people. Now, every elder is supposed to be apt to teach because they're so familiar with the word of God. But some of our elders are given the gift to teach, and they're the ones that, that, that would teach more regularly to the congregation. So we're, we're all called to evangelize and share our faith, right? But some have the gift of evangelism. Remember Cecil a few weeks ago? Oh, my gosh. You know, what a gift. But we all don't have the same gifts. God uses different people in different ways. And so if you're a part of the body of Christ, you're not the whole thing. And so different people, different gifting, different parts. And verse 5 goes on, and it says, so they have this, this, this language that they're able to speak. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Again, this is because Pentecost was one of those three yearly feasts that the Jews were required to come to in order to fulfill their religion. And in Jesus' day, the Jews had gone through quite a bit of scattering. And so this is the Roman Empire in Jesus' day. And, it, and if you look at every one of these dots, whether they be full, if they're full, they're a big dot, uh, a big group of Jews. If they're not full or empty, they're a smaller group of Jews. But Jews are spread out all the way into the British Isles, all the way down to the end of Morocco, all the way around in this area. Jews are known to be everywhere during this time. And there would be Jews from all over the Roman Empire during this time. Pax Romana, Roman peace, Roman roads. Travel was good during this time relatively compared to other times in history. And people from all over would come and they all had their own dialects. And if they were good Jews, they could also speak Hebrew. And if they were Romans in the Roman Empire, they most likely also spoke some Aramaic or Koine Greek. So they're here. In verse, in Jerusalem, and it says in verse 6, And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Now understand, on the day of Pentecost, there was a lot of languages going on. And so when people might get the gift of tongues, sometimes they think, okay, what language is this? It's not always an earthly language. And it's interesting because you can kind of tell, and I know... Uh, with mine, I was very skeptical of the gift of tongues, and when God gave me utterance, I found some Latin base to my particular tongue, right? And uh, I go, okay, well, that helps me because I'm a nerd, and I'm not going to let go of my senses and just be crazy. So God really had to push me. It really took me about four years. I felt like I had the gift, but I didn't trust it because I'm, mm, that's weird, right? And so God had to give me some assurances with it. I wish I wasn't that way, but I am that way. And uh, God doesn't condemn me for it. He ministers to me where I'm at. <laughs> you know, what a blessing, right? But Paul mentions there's also tongues of angels in 1 Corinthians 13. You may speak with the tongues of men or the tongues of angels. And so your, your language that you may receive if you have the gift of tongues may only be a language that's understood in the heavenlies and not on earth at all. But these people from all over the world were hearing these disciples speak in their own languages. And again, there's 120 of them. And so if they're all speaking, that's 120 different languages, possibly, right? So they could nail quite a few people. And some of the tongues they may have been speaking may have been tongues of angels, but we don't know, okay? Verse 7, And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear, and, and they're saying, aren't all these guys country bumpkins and not sophisticated? That's what they're saying. Like, how could they know this? And how is it we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Bagheera, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And so they're hearing 
things in their own native language. And what are they hearing? The wonderful works of God. It wasn't just gibberish. And you need to know, it wasn't, sir, I need to speak to you in your language and witness to you about Christ. That's not what they were saying. They were worshiping God. Do you guys see that? And do you guys realize when people look at your life and they see that you're worshiping God and you actually believe what you're saying, it is a witness. Like sometimes we have these things, they're called crusades or rallies or whatever, and, and people are invited, you know, bring unbelievers here. And then they sing Christian worship music, and it's like, what in the world are you doing? Why does that make any sense? Well, it makes sense because when you worship God, it is a witness. And remember, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will go witnessing. That's not what it says, does it? It says you will exist as a witness. Your life is a witness. Is it a good one or a bad one? And so your worship of God is a witness to God, uh, unto God for other people to see. And, and, and so um, they were speaking, they were praising God with their language. And so understand that tongues is a, is a prayer or a praise language. It isn't like, I'm going to speak in tongues and then give you a teaching, because that's different. A teaching is a teaching, and it's in a known tongue. You see what I'm saying? So it's a different. It's a, it's a prayer language. This is why Paul says that, that in a group, if you have any tongues, they're supposed to be interpreted, right? Because what good does it do if you're just praising God on your own? You're just like, hey, I'm just praising God in the corner, and we're in a group. Just look at me, <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense. So when you actually understand what tongues are, they're from man's heart to God, not God's heart to man, okay? And they're very different. So, Paul addressed this. He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. You see how that works? In Acts 2, the disciples are praising God. Tongues is a way of expressing thanks and praise to God. So, Paul told the Corinthians, tongues do not benefit the church unless there is an interpretation. They're, yet, they are still a way of giving thanks well. It, it's, a, it's a good way to praise God. 1 Corinthians 14, remember, 12, 13, and 14 are about the gifts, spiritual gifts. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I also will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. And when you sing, what are you doing? You're praising God, right? And, and, and it, it's, it's neat. If God has given you uh, the gift of tongues, and, and for me, I go into a lot of foreign countries, and I sit in a lot of worship services that I don't know the music. And if I know the song, I'll sing it in English and mess up everybody around me. <laughs> but if I don't know the song, I'll just worship God in my prayer language, my praise language. And I don't do it loud to get people to look at me, but it's my way of being able to worship in a place where I don't know the language. It goes on to say, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, verse 16, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. He isn't able to join in your thanks. The uninformed is the person in the service who doesn't understand what you're saying, and they want to be able to join in on your praise. So the tongues spoken in front of other people does not give the people that don't understand it any value because they're not able to praise God with you. So tongues without an interpretation, if the church is gathered, does not help the rest of the church praise with you. Now you need to understand, because some of you ask, well, why in the world give tongues at all? Well, listen, there are times when English words just cannot express the love you have towards God. And there's times, you know, for people like me, because I'm a nerd, I always want to understand everything. And so I filter out some of those lavish things that my heart wants to cry out to God. Right? And I water them down. And my prayers are nowhere near as beautiful as my daughters or my wives or most of you women in here. Or some men are great at expressing their emotions. I'm not one of those. And so for me, it's such a blessing because my heart and my spirit can cry out without my brain filtering it out. You understand the, the blessing of that and the freedom that, that it gives me in my spirit? You know, so for me, I understand this is the reason. For other people, it may be other reasons. 
And God gives you gifts where you're not necessarily good at something, right? He gave me a gift to teach because without it, I wouldn't be a good teacher. Makes sense, right? Why would he give a good teacher a gift to be a good teacher, right? And, and, and so for me, this is, this is what it does. Now, I, I hope this removes some of the mystery away from the whole idea of tongues for you guys. Right now, other people say, well, in this weird island, people jo- jump up and they speak gibberish and everything. Listen, Satan always tries to imitate what God does that's good in order to discredit what God is doing is good. You just need to understand it. So people say that all the time. So you shouldn't do that because other people do it. Why throw the baby out with the bathwater? You know, God created sex as a gift and a way to procreate because he loves babies. And he better make it fun or no babies, right? <laughs> he loves babies, right? And it's a way to un- unite and, and, and connect with the person that you're, you're committed to for a lifetime. This is, this is what sex is designed for. But the world has taken sex and really messed it up, so you shouldn't do sex anymore. Sorry, guys. We're not going to do that with that, but what about the gift of tongues? Because other people abuse it, you're not going to use it. Right? You see what I'm saying? And so I really, you know, think through these things. It's like, man, if you look in the scriptures, it has the answer to these things. And there are a lot of people that abuse it and make it look crazy. But the thing is, that's their problem. I want to use the blessings that God has given me for the purpose for which he gave them to me. You ever give someone a gift and then go over to the house and find it in the closet all dusty and hidden away? It's like, thanks for the gift, you know? I mean, don't look at my closets, guys. You give me a lot of gifts over the years. <laughs> or you go on eBay and you find it for sale. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, great. Verse 12, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Some were amazed and some were perplexed, but others mocked. Guys, whenever God is moving, people are going to have different reactions. They're going to have different reactions. If if God starts using you in an incredible way, people are going to go, wow, that's crazy. And then other people are going to start mocking you. Happens all the time. It's, it's just Satan's tool to distract you and distract others from hearing what God is doing through you. But listen, oftentimes when someone mocks someone else, it reveals hurt or fear on their part. They've been hurt by something or they're afraid of what you're promoting. When people have decided that they do not want to know truth in their life nor discover whether or not there is a God, then they have to somehow justify themselves and their choice to believe God in the face of seeing his works. So all they can do is ridicule and scorn the messenger bringing God's word to them. It's the old routine. If you can't discredit the message, or in this instance, the works of God, then try to find a way to discredit the messenger. But either way, God does not appreciate mockers and scoffers. Proverbs 19.29, and this is just a few. (laughs) Judgments are prepared for scoffers. And beatings for the backs of fools. Proverbs 29 8. Scoffers set a city aflame, but when wise men, wise men turn wrath away. 2 Peter 3 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days and walking according to their own lusts. Now skip to verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. You know, so sometimes I get mad when people mock me and scoff me. Sometimes I go, whoa, like that's radical what you're saying. I remember when I was standing up for Hannah Overton, who was falsely accused of murder, and I knew she was innocent. And I, and I, 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 I loved the little boy that died in her care. We considered adopting him before they considered adopting him. And, and so we're in this situation, and I stood up for And someone mocked me online. They said, I would never go to a church where a pastor supports someone like that. And the response in my head was, whoa, you would never go to a church where a pastor would support you if you're accused of being guilty even though you're truly innocent. And I thought, that's a bummer. Poor you. It didn't affect me because I understood, like, whoa. Do you even know what you're saying? You don't. And so mockers and scoffers will be there. And, and they ask, whatever could this mean? And that's what Peter's going to address next time. And then others ask, the, the mockers, are they drunk? Like, 
Like, if all of a sudden you could speak French fluently. Like, give me a beer, man, because now I can learn any language. Are you kidding me? Uh, hint. Being drunk does not make you smarter. Okay? <laughs> Ephesians 5.18, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but do the opposite, be filled with the Spirit. Not spirits, the Spirit. <laughs> they are not under the influence of alcohol, but they're under the influence of the Spirit of God. And being under the influence of the Spirit is way different than being under the influence of wine. And so there is a reason, though, they are compared. Why? Wine and being filled with the Spirit. Well, one is the real deal. One is a cheap substitute. They're both, they both offer peace, joy, and an answer to your hurts. They both offer fellowship, friends, a feeling of well-being. But one lasts. One is temporary. One improves your being. One destroys your character. One betters your judgment, while the other one hinders it. You see, there, there's, a, there's this difference between the two, and a lot of people say, I'm drunk in the Spirit, and I'm going to drive home and red, red lights and swipe side. No, that's not being drunk in the Spirit. The Spirit is totally opposite of being drunk. 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be drunk in the Spirit. No, it doesn't say, just be sober. Why? Sober is the opposite of being drunk. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So being sober, though, is also not being somber. Being sober is not this. What are you? I'm a Christian. You know? It's not being somber. It means being alert, awake, aware, and on top of your gang. The older I get, guys, the harder it is for me to focus and concentrate. Because now I'm an old guy with ADD instead of a young guy with ADD, right? And I don't have as much energy. Okay? I hate, I hate taking any type of pain medication. You know why? My brain gets foggy. Last thing I want to do is make my brain foggy because it's foggy enough as it is, <laughs> right? You know? How, how would you guys like it? Oh, yeah, I had a six-pack last night where I was preparing this study. <laughs> you know, it's like the opposite. I want to be alert and aware, okay? Alert and aware. So being filled with the Spirit allows you the power and ability to be all that God wants you to be to the fullest, and alcohol does the opposite, right? Are they full of wine? No, they're full of the Spirit. Man, they're speaking languages they didn't know. That's pretty awesome. And guys, when you're filled with the Spirit and you're on top of your game, you are doing things that you have no right to be doing. You are witnessing to people you have no right to be witnessing. You have logic that you don't have, right? And, and, and you, you ever talk to somebody and God wants to minister to them and he's using you to do so and, and you finish up and you go, man, I wish I recorded that because that was good. Maybe I ought to write a book, <laughs> you know, and you can't remember anything. You know why? It wasn't you. It was the Spirit of God working through you. And you were on top of your game because God wanted to use you to minister to the person in front of you, okay? And so remember that all this, this coming of the Holy Spirit, was prophesied in the Old Testament and foretold in the New Testament. Joel, we're going to look at this next week when Peter addresses this, but in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. In the future, the spirit's going to come upon them in a way that they never experienced before. And then John 7, on the last and great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom these believing in him would receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus saying, the Spirit's coming. It's coming. And then in Matthew 3, 11, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this is what we're looking at. Jesus said it again and again, and it's even in more places in the New Testament. Okay, now I want you to know, Pastor, you're talking about something I'm totally uncomfortable with. Listen, I understand where you are, because I was raised in a church that would just ignore all the scriptures in the Bible that had anything to do with the power of the Holy Spirit in any supernatural way. Sure, we can understand teaching, so the Spirit moves in teaching. We can understand this and that and the other, but, but, but if you talk about someone being healed, if you talk about someone getting wisdom and knowledge above you know, their pay grade or whatever it is. No, 
You know, it can't happen. They wouldn't even say, no, it can't happen. They just ignore it, right? But listen, if you trust the Father, if you trust the Son, logically you need to do what? Trust the Spirit. And so I don't, you don't even need to use the terminology, baptism of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. Just say, God, I want everything that you have for me, and I want to surrender to you. This is what it takes, a willingness, not the right vocabulary. Now, here's a verse you're familiar with out of Matthew, but it's also in Luke. It's repeated in Luke, the same teaching from Jesus. So, you, so, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? How many of you guys quote this verse, you know, ask, seek, and knock, in a different context? What is the context? The Holy Spirit, isn't it? You guys see that? Many of you are going, I've never heard it that way before. You know why? We always take it out of context. Now, it does ask, seek, and knock. I, I think it, it applies in many things spiritually. But specifically, in context here, what is he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Now, the reason sometimes we don't apply it to the Holy Spirit is because the writer of, the, of Matthew equated the Holy Spirit with good things when he was talking about what Jesus said. Because it says, if then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what? Good things to those who ask him. So that's where we kind of mess up, right? Because every good thing, ask, seek, and knock, and God will give it to you, right? Well, so the principle's there. But if you take the two and you put them together, what is the good things talking about? Matthew chapter 7. Compare it with Luke chapter 11. What is it? Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit a good thing? Right. Don't push the Holy Spirit away. And don't say, well, people get crazy with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I'm not going to do that. Listen, you follow God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, those gifts that are associated with them follow you. You don't follow gifts. They follow you. Understand that. That's where some people get it wrong because it's all about the gifts. And we're going to have a crazy circus-like atmosphere in the church. And we're going to be here to watch the gifts. No, you're there to worship God and learn about God. And then what happens? The gifts follow the believer. Believers don't follow gifts. You guys understand it? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, not some manifestation, right? He is my Lord and Savior. So if you understand the way the Spirit works in your life and to what purpose, you will not be drawn away and distracted by those who abuse the teaching of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? So I, I like to say of us, Pentecostals think we're Baptists, Baptists think we're Pentecostals. You know, I mean, I think we're probably in a pretty good balanced place. But you need to understand, Jesus is my Savior. And these are the things that he promised me. And I want to be the fullest for my Savior. I want to have every tool to worship and to serve him completely. There was a photographer for a national, a national magazine who was assigned to take pictures of a great forest fire. And he was advised that a small plane would be waiting to fly him over the fire. So he arrives at the airstrip an hour before sundown, and there's a small Cessna waiting for him. He jumps in with his equipment. He said, let's go. And the young man, it, it looks a little tense, but he takes off, and he's flying a little erratically, but, you know, maybe it's just a tribulation uh, from the fire. And he says, fly over the north side of the fire, said the photographer, and make several low passes. And the pilot looks at him nervously and says, why? He says, because I'm going to take pictures. I'm a photographer, and that's what photographers do. They take pictures. And after a long pause, this nervous pilot said, You mean you're not my instructor? <laughs> so here's the thing. Are you being led by the Spirit in your life? Because if you reject the Spirit, all the interpretation you're bringing to the, the Scriptures, you're grunting through. And you're figuring it out, them out in your own mind. And, and, and the efforts that you're doing, you're, you're doing them logically, which is fine, but it's not being led by the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and so you can do a certain amount. You can understand a certain amount. But it's so much easier 
when you're trusting the Holy Spirit to work within you as you're following the principles of the Word of God. And listen, the Holy Spirit is just as much God as Father and Son. And the Holy Spirit is responsible for writing the, the, the New Testament in the sense that, that, that godly men are moved or breathed into by the Holy Spirit, said Paul to Timothy, to write the Scriptures. Is the Holy Spirit going to oppose what he's written in his character? So, guys... The Holy Spirit aligns in your heart and confirms the Scripture in your heart. We have fences and we have gates, and we don't go outside of those because the Holy Spirit set those gates. And so there might be another spirit you might be following, or you might be confused, and you might try to step out of that, but what do you have to guide you? The Word of God. It sets up those fences for you so you don't have to be afraid because it's the same Holy Spirit that penned the Word of God that's also moving you and guiding and directing you in the details. You see... The Bible gives the framework. I say this again and again, but the Holy Spirit gives the details. And that's how it works in our life. And if, you don't, if you're just figuring out the details without the Holy Spirit, you're doing it without the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit is in the Word of God for sure. But the details of you being surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So who's your pilot? Your flesh or the Holy Spirit? So what was the formula? I would say willingness and obedience. Surrender to God and his ways above our own. It isn't waiting at the altar for hours. It isn't being anointed by older, uh, oil and prayed for by elders. It can be those things, and that's fine. But it's not always those things. Because you can do those things, but if you're not willing and obedient, you may not receive the fullness of God in your life. You surrender to God and his ways above your own. Proverbs 123, Turn at my rebuke, and surely I will pour out my spirit on you, and I will make my words known to you. So a stubborn Christian says, I'm just going to do things my way, but Lord, fill me with your spirit. Does that work? Does that make any sense? It doesn't. Turn at my rebuke, and I will pour out my spirit on you, and make my words known to you. Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that time of refreshing. And, and Peter does actually deal with this act of repentance as a condition of the Holy Spirit filling you in context to that verse. And then Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What? You were not willing. And so what God is continually calling us to do is to be willing to trust him and surrender. And the thing about that as believers, he never forces his will upon us. So you can be a believer and you can still kind of push back for a while, can't you? And then you can draw near. And God, the best place to be is just drawing near. The best place to be is drawing near. And so he hurts over the people because they're rejecting him. And so surrender is a good word <laughs> when concerning God. Not just anything. You just don't eat up anything. But when considering God and the scriptures and the way he lays it out. Are you surrendered as a living sacrifice and open to whatever God has for you today? Oh, not if it leads me to Mombasa, Kenya. Oh, if it leads you to Mombasa, Kenya, praise God. And you will love every minute of it. And you will be more satisfied in your Christian walk than if you live on Ocean Drive and you're just retiring with a fat retirement. You will be more satisfied in a mud hut than in a mansion. I beseech you, Paul is begging. If the Holy Spirit forced this upon you, he wouldn't have to beg. But when Paul says this, he says, I'm begging you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Why, isn't it, why is it reasonable to surrender to God's ways in your life? Why is it reasonable? Because he loves you even more than you love yourself. That's a lot, isn't it? Andrew Murray says this, May not a single movement of my life be spent outside the light of love and joy of God's presence, and not a moment without the entire surrender of myself as a vessel for him to fulfill, or to fill full of his spirit and his love. Surrender. And the thing is, we need to surrender again and again, don't we? 
my flesh is a fighter. I may not be very big. I'm getting older. But man, I think my flesh is like heavyweight champion of the world. <coughs> so I need to surrender to whatever God has for me. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you once again for your word and how it works in our lives, God. And this is a, a tough subject in the sense that it's, it's unique. The idea of being filled with the Spirit and the possibility that you give us gifts that we don't understand and that we can't control. But Lord, help our faith to be that which understands the truth of your word, which gives us guidelines and limitations so that we can also be filled with your spirit and soar and move with your spirit. And if the spirit moves in Asia, that we would be in Asia. If the spirit is moving on the west side, that we'd be on the west side. If the spirit's moving in our own family, that we'd be willing to minister to our own family, God. Lord, we want to be led by you. We want to be effective. And that means being led by you for your kingdom. And so, Lord, may it be that, that we as a church surrender that we don't look at others' opinions of us, that we merely surrender to you and follow you, and that you may do what you will in our lives, God, because we trust you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to give you a chance to respond to that in a minute if you desire to be prayed for. Uh, but at this point, we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to also uh, have, a, have an opportunity for you to worship the Lord through tithes and offerings if you enjoy doing that during worship, which many of you do. And so the ushers will pass by. As soon as they pass by, though, feel free to continue to worship. If you desire to stand up, that's great. Um, but um, it's also a time of, respo of, of response. And, and if God has just ministered to your heart and you desire to be prayed for, for a filling of the Holy Spirit or surrender to God in your life just more, or you've been wrestling back against God and taking your life back from him and you'd like to surrender more to it, we'd love to pray with you and for you. And so there'll be some, some elders and leaders in the church that are up here to pray with you and for you as we continue to worship. And certainly if you're here and you don't know Jesus and you just recognize, man, I need to give in to him because I've been wrestling against him for a long time. That's all it takes is giving in to him and we'd love to pray with you and for you. And so we'll be up here to pray with you for any of these needs whatsoever. So God bless you guys. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord together. <laughs> 